Let's pray. So, Lord God, what are the requirements? We sometimes wonder, what is it that you want? Sometimes when life gets hard and when we face extreme difficulty, we ask that question even more pointedly. What do you want, God, from us personally, from our community, from our world? What do you want for our world? And as we get caught up in that question, the prophet Micah comes with a basic, simple, but powerful statement. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly before you. Strengthen us in faith as we worship today and keep these words in front of us, in our hearts, in our minds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On the afternoon, right before Halloween night, uh, last Wednesday, God delivered a sweet treat to us here at Celebration. And this is what happened. Our, uh, our business manager, Tammy Yap, came back to my office just as I was getting ready to leave for deer camp, and she had this envelope in her hand, and it said, fact donation, money collected from lemonade stand. And then underneath it had the three, na uh, three names of young women and ladies in our church, and at the bottom it said, $36.50. And, uh, she ha and she handed me this envelope, and uh, you may know, as we've been talking for the last month, that that a partnership with FACT, Feeding Area Children Together, is one of our mission goals for next year. And we've been talking and telling people for the last month that when you jump in and, and, and grow in your generous giving to celebration uh, next year, that's one of the, the goals that we want to meet. That's one of the initiatives that we have. And Tammy knows that I love stuff like this. So she gave me the envelope, and I took a picture of it. I cut off the names of the, of the three young ladies uh, just for their own privacy, and I posted it on my Facebook page. And I left for deer camp. Very important, right? Deer camp, we got priorities here. And I wanted people to see what God is doing through their church and through the children and through the youth and all of the people who are a part of what we're doing here. But I was not prepared for what would happen next because a celebration member saw that post and he wrote on my page and said, I want to match that $36.50. Is there anyone else out there who wants to come with me and match the generosity of those three young ladies? And this thing took off last Wednesday. By the time I got to deer camp, 11 families had jumped in to support FACT, Feeding Area Children Together, to the tune of $401.50. Later that night, as all was prepared for the deer opener, I opened my page again, and 32 families had offered to match that $36.50. That's a total of $1,168 for local kids to be, to be fed. The next day, the church staff put out a pitcher of lemonade <laughs> out in the office to, in honor of those, those I call them the lemonade leaders <laughs> of our church, to honor those three young ladies who did this, so as people were coming and bringing their offering and their match of that thirty-six fifty, uh, they could have a drink of lemonade. And actually, I have to tell you honestly, we have not we have sort of lost track of the running total at this point, <laughs> for how much people in our church have given to to fact. And one of the reasons is because people rounded up their offerings from thirty-six fifty to thirty-seven. Some people rounded up their offerings to forty dollars. And, and some people wrote out their checks to fact directly, but we think right now that somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,800 has been given by 45 to 50 families in our church to put a pack full of food on the back of a hungry child in our community when they leave school. And you know what? I think that is way, way cool. Don't you? I think that's amazing. Now, I want you to hold on to that story for a second, and I'm going to try to draw that in to that experience into our God story today from Micah. In 701 BC, the king of Assyria, a guy by the name of Sennacherib, attacked uh, the southern kingdom of Judah, and he laid waste to 36 towns and villages, just flattened them, destroyed everything. And he laid siege to the city of Jerusalem, and he famously boasted. I locked up the king of Israel, Hezekiah, like a bird in a cage. But he did not destroy Jerusalem. And later, the prophet Micah appeared, and he spoke out to the nation, and he said, look, 
you have fallen away from God. You have fallen away from your relationship with the one who has led you this far. But then he spoke to the pain and the suffering of those 36 villages that were lost to the Assyrian king. And in that process, the prophet Micah spoke out to the people a rhetorical question about their perspective. It's the kind of question that people ask when they're hurting. The kind of question that people ask when they're grieving. The kind of question we all ask when we, when we look around the world and we, we realize how far the world has fallen from peace. When we hear stories like we heard this week of, of the gun violence in, in uh, Thousand Oaks, California, or the wildfires when cities are flattened by, by armies. And the question is, what does God want? God, what do you want? And, and what, does you, what do you desire, God, for this world that seems to have fallen so far away from your heart? And when you think about it, almost everything that we do as a church, a community, life, prayer, worship, service, all of it centers around how we answer that question that, that, that Micah asks. What does God want? What does God really desire for this world? And what does God want for me personally in my life of faith? Now, as we were saying earlier to the children, in the, time, in the times of the early Old Testament, money had not been invented yet for, for transactions, for economy, for, for giving, for living, for trading. Money came later, and that means that when people traded or operated in their life or gave anything, they gave in-kind offerings. <laughs> they gave oil, the fruit of the land, livestock. That's how they operated in their economy a day to day, the stuff that they owned or the stuff that they made. There was no other way to operate. So when you read your Bible and you hear about offerings or sacrifices, what we're talking about is we're talking about people who brought what they had grown or what was the fruit of the land that they had uh, as va a value to honor God and to give to the church. And, and when those things were given to honor God, they were then used to support people in need and to support the ministry of the church and even to support the government at that time. It wasn't until some time later that people began to give money as taxes and offerings. So, God, uh, so people openly asked, what does God want? What does God want for me in my life? What does God want in light of all that God has done and in the relationship that I have with God? And then Micah asks this series of rhetorical questions. Should I come to God with burnt offerings, with, with calves a year old, which would be extravagant if you lived in an agrarian society, right? And then he ups the ante. Would the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams? Would the Lord be pleased, pleased with 10,000 rivers of oil? Which is ridiculous hyperbole, of course. And finally, the prophet says, uh, does the Lord want my, my firstborn? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul, which of course is a, a crazy talk, but that's the point. The prophet wants to reach and say to the people, what does God want? What does God want? And if God is so good and the world has fallen so far away from God and my own life needs to be turned around, what in this religious equation of sacrifice will move God to accept me? How much calves, how much oil, how much wine, how much grain? Is it a transaction, God? Just tell me what I need to be and do, and I'll do it. And Micah, of course, then responds to his, to his uh, rhetorical question with one of the most famous lines in the entire Old Testament. God has shown you what God requires. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. The prophet Micah sets up that rhetorical question and then says, God is not looking for a grand gesture. God is not looking for some occasional offering. The prophet says, God is bigger than your ceremonies. God is bigger than your rituals. However, God is interested in the whole of your life. In all that you are caught up in living with a, in accord with what God's will is for the world. I would call it lemonade leadership. Do justice love kindness, walk humbly before your God. 
And in those small places where those kind of things happen, Micah says, amazing things will result. As a matter of fact, he says, even the Messiah will not come from big old wealthy Jerusalem or famous Rome, but from this tiny little city, Bethlehem, the smallest city of the smallest clan of Judah. And as a matter of fact, when you look back in the Bible, that's how it always happens, right? God continues to work through the small, the underestimated. Uh, last week, our God story was the story of Naaman. But again, Naaman is powerful, but God doesn't work through Naaman. God works through his, his humble servants and slaves that say, Naaman, maybe you should be thinking about this differently. And we see this <coughs> even today, even in the last week, <coughs> in our own church. When the inspiration for generosity does not come from the lead pastor with all of his wisdom and all of his insight and all of his theological knowledge and all of his pastoral care experience, no. From three young ladies who had a lemonade stand, what did they know that we could learn? And if we asked those three young ladies, what does God want, what would they say? Do they know the words of Micah? Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly before your God, because they sure are living it. You know what? In the end, maybe that's the answer to the prophet's question. What does God want? And Micah says, live it. This is not a transaction in which you bring so much grain or so many animals to be sacrificed to God. <clears throat> this is not a transaction. It's a relationship in which you are living. And Micah says justice. The word is mishpat in Hebrew. It means fairness and equality and inclusion for all. Hesed in, in Hebrew means kindness. It means love and loyalty and faithfulness. Do these things and walk in companionship with God. Live it full on and then watch and see what God accomplishes in this world through you. This is our annual consecration weekend. I would imagine that uh, some of you or all of you, most of you brought a commitment card along uh, with intent to support celebration in the next year. It would be very good before we fill out a commitment card to support any church to ask, what does God want? What does God want? How much value is attached to this relationship I have with God uh, when I make this offering? Is it calves? Is it oil? Is it animals? Is it grain? Micah says, no, it's lemonade leadership. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. This thing that we do in, in making a commitment and in living generously is not a grand gesture. It's not an offering or merely a ritual. It is our way of life that reflects this walk with God in justice and kindness. And last year, we took the time at this point in the year to say, if you support what we're doing and you grow in your giving, we're going to build that global ministry uh, uh, partnership with Kosovo. We're going to uh, double down on supporting kids going to camp. Uh, we're going to support our staff. We're going to grow our worship ministry. And God has affected all of those things in the last year. And we're saying today, when you bring those commitments and we grow in our, in, in our generosity, we're going to do more with fact, feeding area children together. We're going to double down again on kids going to camp. We're going to grow adult faith and expand our capacity to tell God's story. It's lemonade leadership. It's generosity. And it grows up from places that you would never expect to do more than you could ever imagine. Have you ever heard the story, the old story of Stumpy and Martha? Maybe you've heard this story. And one day Stumpy and Martha went to the state fair and there was a guy there selling airplane rides for $10. And Stumpy said, oh, Martha, I would love to go on an airplane ride. And she said, well, Stumpy, I'm sorry, we just can't afford it, you know, and $10 is $10. So Stumpy didn't get to go on his airplane ride. And the next year they went back to the state fair and there was the same guy with his airplane and rides were $10. And Stumpy said, boy, Martha, I would love to go on an airplane ride. And Martha said, I'm sorry, Stumpy, but we can't afford it. $10 is $10. So the third year they go back and there's the guy again with his airplane. And he overhears Stumpy and Martha arguing about the airplane ride. And he says, I'll tell you what, folks. He says, uh, 
Uh, I'll take you up for a ride, and if you can stay completely silent and quiet in the back while I'm, while I'm flying, I'll let you ride for free. How's that sound? So they get in the plane and they take off and they're flying and the pilot's doing his best to make him cry out. He's doing barrel rolls and flips and dives and everything. Not a word from the back of the plane. And finally they come t coasting in for a landing and the pilot says over his shoulder, boy, folks, I sure am impressed. I can't believe it, but I gave you my best and, and, and you stayed quiet the entire time. And Stumpy says, well, I was going to say something when Martha fell out. <laughs> but $10 is $10. What does God want? I guarantee you, it's not your $10. That is not what God wants. But when the whole of who we are is caught up in the abundant life that God desires for this world, amazing things happen. And sometimes it starts with a little lemonade, which I think is way, way cool. Amen. Please stand as you are able. Let's sing our hymn of the day. with me. 